The kitchen is often called the heart of the home. Why? Well, because friends and family are drawn to a place that is warm, cozy, and inviting. That's why I'm inviting you to my kitchen today. It may be chilly outside, but inside we're going to put together a hearty pot of soup, hear a down-home story, and listen to some beautiful instrumental music. Welcome to Carol's Kitchen. Our musical guests today are three members of the Ostrander family from Beaver Dam. It's Justine, Hope, and Hannah. They're all three accomplished violinists and pianists. You know, the first contact I had with anyone with the name of Ostrander goes back about 30 years <laughs> when their dad, Peter Ostrander, was in one of my Fundamentals of Public Speaking classes. Well, history repeated itself a couple <laughs> years back when Justine was in uh, a Fundamentals of Public Speaking class as well. But it's a pleasure to have the three sisters here today performing for us. Justine is a senior. She is a violin pedagogy and performance major at MBU and has distinguished herself by winning first place in the commencement music competition on campus and traveling this past summer with the heritage singers. And after graduation, she plans to get a master's degree and open her own uh, music studio. Hope uh, is a college sophomore majoring in communications art, uh, the photography track. Uh, her career aspirations are to be a professional wedding photographer. But I have a feeling that no matter what she does for a career, she will always be playing the violin and piano, at least <laughs> avocationally. And Hannah, the baby, <laughs> is a high school junior, uh, hoping in a couple of years to major in violin pedagogy and arranging. And for the past two years, she has placed first in the Maranatha Music Prep School Evaluation Program. Congratulations. Thank you. For their first selection today, the Ostrander sisters will be playing on their violins Jack Bullock's arrangement of Bugler's Holiday by Leroy Anderson. <laughs>
For our main dish today, I will be preparing a pot of soup, and I call this can-can soup. Now it has nothing to do with lining up and kicking your legs like in a can-can, no dancing necessary. It is a wonderful hearty soup that is just made from cans full of the right ingredients that taste wonderful together. So before we start adding the elements, uh, we've got to create uh, some rice, some cooked rice. So I've got a cup of instant rice and I'm putting it in a, uh, another cup of boiling hot water. It takes about five minutes for that to fluff up. So we'll get that fluffing up while we add our cans of soup. First of all, a can of a spaghetti sauce. I like uh, the garlic and herb. And I'm putting that in a pot that has already been heated up to a medium temperature. So that will get us started. Now the next ingredient I will add is a can of chili, and it's the chili with no beans in it. We will add some beans, but I, this is our meat part of our dish. I would like to get it all, so I've got a, a good long knife here. to scrape out all the ingredients and mix those together. Then we will add, without draining any of the liquids, several cans of different vegetables. This is a can of mixed vegetables. can of corn, a can of diced tomatoes, mix those together, it's already looking very very hearty. and a can of mild chili beans. If you are one that likes things a little hotter, you're welcome to choose something a little hotter. But the mild chili beans. And then one can full of a uh, beef broth. And I suppose in a pinch you could make a chicken broth, but I've got beef broth. You can buy broth in cans, uh, and you could certainly use that. As you can see, this is a pretty hearty looking soup already, and we haven't even added uh, the rice to it. But it's going to need to heat up, and the rice has to continue fluffing. I'll just share a personal story about having made this uh, soup oh, several years back for my parents' 65th wedding anniversary dinner. I made this soup and served it as the, uh, the appetizer, and several people said, don't bring anything else on. Just keep bringing me soup. This is awesome. And so, anyway, from a little personal testimony of others, the final ingredient before we uh, add the rice is chili powder. And this would be optional, so it makes it sort of feel like a, a variation of chili. And this is pretty unscientific, but what I'd like to do is sprinkle it so that I have chili powder, just a, a light 
coating of it across the whole pot and that has always seemed to be about the right amount uh, for uh, the average palette to give it a little a little kick <clears throat> and if you don't like chili powder don't add it and I don't really add any any other spices or salt or pepper because most of these canned items come with plenty of sodium already in them and so it and and, and also the broth so there's no need uh, to add it it's just I suppose someone uh, with a, a different palate might add some later but as a general rule I would not the uh, the rice is just about ready and we will add that at really at the last minute that way um, it will maintain its own individual flavor. If you add it too soon, especially with the, uh, the instant rice, it will um, start absorbing the, the juices from the, the, the tomato base, which isn't all bad, but sometimes it gets a little mushy. And so I will add that just before uh, we are prepared to eat it. So I will keep this on a medium heat. I'll cover it up. And when it comes to a boil, it'll be ready to eat. As my mom would say, soup's on. Now the Ostrander sisters are going to play for us a chardash. That is a Hungarian gypsy dance, which is characterized by a slow beginning and then a wild, frenetic finish. This particular chardash was written by Michael McLean.
For our side dish today, we're going to create a pumpkin spice dip to be served with uh, sliced apples. Start out with a can, like a 15 ounce can of, of pumpkin, 100% pure pumpkin. Into this, we mix <clears throat> the powder only of uh, instant vanilla pudding. This happens to be sugar free, save a few calories. Could use regular, just the powder. And mix this until it coagulates and you um, gets a little thickened. looks good that's all mixed together to it you add a, a tablespoon excuse me a teaspoon and a half of pumpkin pie spice pumpkin pie spice which uh, you can put together your own combination of things but I just assume let somebody else put them all together And this is crazy, folks, but it's so simple. The last ingredient is uh, an eight ounce tub of non-dairy whip. And this happens to be the, uh, the light version. So you could put you know, the full or any version of non-dairy topping that you, that you prefer and mix it all together and it makes a very hearty portion of, of dip. Be a little patient, mixing it all together. I have brought this to numerous uh, public events, uh, potluck dinners and buffets and those sort of things and never uh, go away from any of those events without sharing the recipe with at least one person. <coughs> And when they discover how simple it is, they think, oh man, even, even I can do it, they say. So, and it is, sir, you can, the truth is, it's, it's a dip, but uh, sometimes I get crazy and just eat uh, a little bowl of it uh, for, um, Keep it refrigerated. It will last for a long time, but uh, I don't think it will last very long in the sense that you and your family members will like it so much you'll eat a lot of it fast. And I serve it with sliced apples, which I've, I have already sliced. And I like to uh, caution people that in their choice of apples to get a crisp eating apple rather than a baking apple. A baking apple could be like a Jonathan, um, a Cortland apple are what are considered baking apples. Uh, I prefer galas or pink ladies and turns out the store had pink ladies yesterday so I got pink ladies and they are very sweet and uh, uh, very crisp. Uh, a way to keep them from going brown, you perhaps have heard of putting lemon juice in uh, water. And I tried something new today uh, about the idea of instead of lemon, putting honey. So I put two tablespoons of honey in a cup of water. And after I cut the apples, I let it let them soak, they say, for a minute in that. And I think we're reasonably successful. There's a little browning in there. Maybe I'll need to up the, uh, the amount of honey because what the air does to when it's when the apple the sliced apple is exposed to it um, the uh, ingredients in honey uh, neutralize that and keep them from going brown so 
here is I'm gonna give a little pre-taste mm. a crisp sweet apple and folks I'm glad that I still have my own teeth and that is a lame segue into our story time about my mom's false teeth. Our story today is entitled Mom's False Teeth. I inherited my mom's false teeth. Now it's not like I was bequeathed them in her last will and testament. I'm surely not going to wear them. But I claimed her extra set of choppers because they remind me of mom's hilarious tooth tails. As mom aged, she had ongoing issues with her false teeth. A good fit seemed to elude her. She was forever getting them relined or changing adhesives. And the shrinking gums that accompany old age didn't help either. One morning when mom was about 80 years old, she awoke to find her teeth missing from her false teeth cup. She vaguely remembered falling asleep with her teeth in and figured she must have removed them sometime during the night, but their current whereabouts was a mystery. A thorough search of her bedroom produced nothing. My sister Sharon hunted for them to no avail. I stopped by mom's house for a look-see. No luck. Meanwhile, mom was a toothless wonder, which wasn't too bad, she said. Dad, Sharon, and the cats Waldo and Murphy didn't mind. But when Sunday loomed ever closer and she faced going to church looking like a hillbilly meemaw, Mom decided she would have to bite the bullet and call the dentist. She would just have to get new teeth. Later that same day, Mom asked Sharon to gather the dirty laundry from the upstairs bedrooms. In Mom's closet, Sharon grabbed a couple stray plastic bags to toss in the trash when she felt something jiggling around in one of them. You guessed it, it was Mom's choppers. Our best guess is that when Mom took out her teeth in the middle of the night, she thought she placed them on her bedside table, but instead accidentally plopped them on the floor. And Waldo, the cat who usually slept with mom, probably went to investigate and decided to play soccer with mom's dentures, ultimately scoring a goal in the plastic bag Sharon found in the closet. Well, all's well that ends well, praise the Lord. A few weeks later, however, I got a frantic call from mom around 10.30 p.m. She had lost her false teeth again. I'll be right over, I promised, and rushed across town, hoping and praying there was something I could do to help. I haven't moved anywhere, Mom declared as I walked through the front door. She was seated in a recliner in the living room, flanked on one side by a tray table and the other by a small wastebasket. I've been sitting here all evening, she said sorting through mail, watching TV. I took out my teeth to swallow my evening pills, and now I can't find my teeth. I checked around her chair, I checked under her chair, I checked in the chair. Uh, we looked in the folds of her clothing and in her pockets. I emptied the wastebasket at her side. Incredibly, mom's teeth had pulled yet another disappearing act. Upon further questioning, I learned that in preparation for trash pickup the next morning, my sister Sharon had emptied all the small waste baskets around the house into large trash bags. And yes, she had emptied the waste basket at mom's side a couple times during the evening. Uh, there was no other option. I would simply have to subdue my gag reflex and dig through a week's worth of trash asking the Lord to help me find those elusive dentures. And sure enough, at the bottom of the second bag of grossness, I found her teeth covered with coffee grounds and who knows what else. Hallelujah. 
Mom's teeth never again went missing. I guess I showed them who's boss. You know, God is well aware of our propensity as human beings to lose things. Luke chapter 15 records a series of three parables in which Jesus, his son, told about three lost items, a lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son, and about the joy that came when the lost was found. The woman who lost her coin told her friends and neighbors, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. When the lost sheep was found, the shepherd called together his friends and neighbors and said, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. And when the lost son returned home, his father threw a huge party exclaiming, Let us eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Then the storyteller, Jesus himself, said, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Yes, Jesus cares about lost things. Lost coins, lost sheep, lost sons, lost sinners, and even lost dentures. In my mom's final years, deciding whether or not to wear her teeth became a moot point, for she enjoyed life with a teeth-optional mindset. After all, her food was pureed, no chewing required. And she was long past worrying about what people thought. And besides, those who loved her didn't care one way or the other. The end. Thank you, ladies, for joining us today. You played beautifully, and now you get to uh, taste test the fruit of my labors. So, <laughs> hope you enjoy. Uh, would you read a Bible verse for us today, please? Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. John six thirty seven b. A great Bible promise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy For a copy of today's recipes, call 920-262-4021 or email watertowntv at charter.net. A copy of this program is available to view on demand at watertowntv.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time.